there's a dimension of reality that we have not been so aware of in the church, most of the church, in the last 200 years. And that's the, um, the world, the invisible world of the rulers and authorities. We catch glimpses of it in scripture, notably one is Colossians 1.16. Colossians 1.16, talking about Jesus. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And of course we read, we read in the following chapter that at the cross he triumphed over them. He triumphed over the rulers and authorities. So this also is part of our job description. In between his two mighty prayers for the church, Paul in Ephesians 3.10, we'll start at, uh, with verse 8, where we have a problem in, in our English translations, because he's talking about the preaching the grace was given to him to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That should be nations. And in many other languages, it says nations. But in our English Bibles, it's translated wrong 99% of the time. Uh, Jim Mellis was the one who told me this. He's done extensive research in this area. He's preaching to the nations the unrich, unsearchable riches of Christ to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So our mission to preach the gospel is not just to human beings, not just to people groups. It is to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So there is an invisible supernatural dimension to our ministries of preaching, of praise, and worship. <clears throat> Many of you have heard me talk about the spirits of the nations. Um, we won't go into that now, but just bear with me. And if you haven't heard the, the Bible study on this, it seems pretty clear that, the, and it's been a Jewish tradition for a long time, that each nation has, has a guardian spirit assigned to it. Um, the 70 nations in Genesis 10 each have a guardian spirit. And you can see, if you, if you go to European museums, and American for that matter, you see portrayals of the spirit of the nation. Down in Geneva, there, just as you go into the city, there are two images of the spirit of Geneva. And in, the, in this 18th and 19th centuries, these were always strong, beautiful women. You, we have liberty in America, Britannia, in the United Kingdom, Marianne in France. And we could name them around the world. Helvetia. Helvetia. Very strong, broad-shouldered, muscular woman with a two-edged sword. And one of the portrayals of the spirit of Geneva is Helvetia embracing the spirit of Geneva and welcoming her into the Confederation, which only happened in the early 19th century. So when we read about nations in the word, I think often it's an inclusive term. We, we only think of geopolitical groups or something, ethnic groups. But in the word, it's, they're very often, when it says the nations, it means also the rulers over the nations. You could call it the soul of the nation if you want to. <clears throat> so these guardians, although they were created by Jesus, as we just read, and they were good, they fell, because all creation fell when Adam and Eve did. So some of them became more evil than others. <clears throat> and I think that has directly to do with the degree of centralization of power nation by nation. The nations that have had most power and authority centralized for long periods of time are, that, that centralization of power constructs a temple where evil spirits come in and, and take over, or the spirits of the nations that, that is there decide, decides that it wants the worship and becomes more and more evil to the point of 
desiring human sacrifice. This is how I see the history of North Korea. China. And in nations where by the grace of God and, and the efforts of a lot of people, the power has been diffused and decentralized, such as Switzerland, it's less evil. It's still fallen, but less evil. There's a psalm that talks about a, a league of ten principalities, ten nations, plotting against the people of God. And there's a, they form a new conspiracy, so it's a new level of attack against the people of God. And the desire is to wipe them out as a nation and to, present, to possess for themselves the pastors of God. So it's the destroyer and it's the thief, the two of the roles of the enemy of our souls. I received this psalm uh, three different times over the last 10 years or so for the Kona campus when it was facing threat of destruction. And um, prayed it out. Usually we were in some kind of leadership group in Kona. But the last time it was, I wasn't in Kona when I prayed it out. I was over here. But standing with them in their, in their lawsuit that threatened to take over the entire property. But as, as I prayed this again, the Lord gave me the assurance that, that we were not going to lose the property. It was going to be okay. And I shared that with Christine, and she had already received that from the Lord. In December of last year, I received this, this passage again as a, a warning to us, I believe a heads up of the Spirit, that this league, there's a newly formed league of principalities coming, that was going to come against the University of the Nations. Not just one campus, but the whole University of the Nations. And then early this year, it got clearer for me, these things are often get clearer over time, that it was an attack first against YWAM and YWAM bases and YWAM ministries. And then if that it succeeded against YWAM, it would come more directly against the university. <clears throat> and we know of several of our bases that have been under attack this year. The situation in Kona that most, most of you probably know about. In Jamaica, they're facing, uh, they faced a lawsuit and lost. And I'm sure there are others. But we want to pray for them this morning, so be thinking of, of things you've heard about that. This is a very real battle, friends. It's not theoretical. It's not just super spiritual. The, the thief and the destroyer regularly attacks us. And in the 80s and 90s, a, a spirit of Absalom received an assignment against us. And by the time that was over, we had lost major campuses, 2,000 staff, and 10 years of growth. The attack did not succeed, but it cost us. And something like that is starting to happen again, I believe. <clears throat> so I sent this, um, I sent an email to Lauren and Darlene in early February and submitted this impression to them in this psalm. And um, yes, it's Psalm 83. And they, they prayed about it and discerned that it was right, so they called a solemn assembly of all their long-term staff and I just heard that they, they prayed the psalm through. I didn't hear anyone at that meeting. Was it, you felt it work, what you were heard? It was a great word to God. Okay. Good. As I shared this with um, Marcus and Maureen last December, um, we all felt that it was... It, was time, it would be time to bring it to this group this month. In between time is when I felt I should send it to Lauren and Darlene also. The, the two verses where, 
where it's, you see the motivations of these spirits are verse 4. Let us wipe them out as a nation, the people of God. <clears throat> and let us possess for ourselves the pastures of God, the thief. So when I read the Psalms, I'm often seeing principalities and where some people say it's just earthly kings, such as Psalm 149, where we read that high praises will bind the rulers. But I don't know how high praises have any effect on politicians. For me, that's really clear that it is rulers of the earth. Many people link the first and the last Psalm, the second and the second to the last. So if we look at Psalm 149 in the light of Psalm 2, it's real clear that those are spiritual authorities. <clears throat> So this is a, a plea. The psalmist writes, <clears throat> Asaph, it says, O oh God, do not keep silence. I'm reading Psalm 83 now. Do not hold your peace or be still, O oh God, for behold, your enemies make an uproar, and those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. They conspire with one accord. Against you they make a covenant. And then in the next three verses, six through nine, ten nations are named. Now this is not a historical event. You won't find these ten nations physically attacking Israel. These are ten principalities that want to destroy the people of God. And then in verse nine, there's a mighty prayer that goes all the way to the end of the chapter interspersed with this imprecation in verse 12, where they say, let us take possession for ourselves of the pastors of God. So these are the twin motivations for the attack. It's, it's destruction and the, the theft of our, <clears throat> our actual physical properties. And of course, over the years, we have lost some major properties, aside from that, the ones we lost in the uh, spirit of Absalom attacks. And of course, the, the enemy can only get to us when there's been sin in the camp or extreme lack of wisdom. And, and um, a couple of the losses of property we had are when people did not listen to Lauren, even though he went there personally, and they kept their properties, uh, separate properties, in one legal structure. And you centralize that and you set yourself up as a target. And we lost the properties. We lost a beautiful property in Ontario, a little campus, and Canadian friends tell me that YOM Canada has still not recovered from that loss fully. And I could go on down, including the, the loss of the Hamilton property, our first property in North America. Anyway. So I submit this impression to you and I believe that the Lord is giving us this heads up so that we can stand together. We can pray as the psalmist does in verses 9 through 18 here. And we can implore his help. And part of our homework then needs to be confession of any sin, any disunity, because we have authority in the measure that we have unity. Or any lack of wisdom, whether legally or, or any other way, that we have left a door open so the enemy can, can attack us. The attack in Jamaica, as I understand it, is the same thing. Two properties, totally different, but in one legal structure, car accident at the distant property, but they sued because they saw the size and the beauty of our Mo Bay campus, and that's, they won the settlement. If they had been legally separated, that would not have happened. Lack of wisdom. Disobedience to YWAM guidelines. I, and then I know there are all kinds of circumstances and reasons, and I know that. It's, these things are not easy. 